I wanted to uh, briefly uh, explain uh, why we did the identity key in Paymail the way that we did it. Um, so a Paymail uh, is uh, basically an email address that supports Bitcoin. So what we did uh, was to create a, a protocol that uses uh, DNS and HTTPS queries basically to, to give a bunch of extra functionality to email addresses. Uh, the primary uh, sort of use case for Paymail right now is just sending money wallet to wallet using something that is equivalent to an email address. So we have this working between a number of different wallets, uh, including, uh, uh, to my knowledge right now, it is a money button, hand cash, uh, simply cash, and relay. And I, I'm not sure if if CentB or Electrum SV have, have, have added it yet, although my knowledge is uh, they've, I mean, they're, they're working on it. I, I don't know whether it's like, like live or in production yet. Uh, and I think that most, uh, most people in, in the industry plan to sort of move to this direction, which we've explained for a number of different reasons. And for what it's worth, it, sort of the top uh, sort of two reasons are basically user friendliness and scalability. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about is there, there's a feature that we built into Paymail originally. So Paymail is a protocol. It's not like it's a, it's a product or something. We, we launched it, uh, you know, sort of, uh, early with, with Money Button, but it's, it's not like it's a product. It is just the name of this protocol for basically adding Bitcoin support to email. So we have an identity key. The identity key is a single semi-stable public key. And what this means is it's semi-stable in the sense that there, there's, there are some useful reasons to have a key that is stable, um, but you can't actually have a permanently stable public key for a name. So we have to revisit this idea of a user and a key simply are not the same thing. So I'll tell you factually, speaking as you know, you know, founder and CEO of Money Button, which is a, a, a Bitcoin SV wallet uh, with a password that the users log into their account with a password. The password is used to encrypt the user's master key, which is a mnemonic, which is then backed up to our servers. If the user loses their password, they actually cannot access their wallet anymore. You need to remember your password or write down the mnemonic and remember the mnemonic or you lose access to your money. Um, now what happens very frequently is that people do actually lose access to their money regularly. It's a regular event uh, that even sophisticated users, and I won't tell stories, but I will say some humorously sophisticated users have lost, humorously in the sense that they're definitely sophisticated, uh, have lost access to their, uh, to their wallets because they forgot their password or they didn't write down their mnemonic. Now usually for these people, they don't lose a lot of money because you learn basically that like basically these people were using their money button wallet as a sort of, uh, you know, they, they weren't too serious about it. They weren't storing most of their money there or something like this. Uh, but, but you know, you, you, you should write these, you know, make sure you record your password mnemonic and so on. In any case, even if, you know, whether you do or not or whatever, it is a regular occurrence that people lose access to their wallets. We have to reset their wallet, but the user can maintain access to their account if they still have their primary email address. So the primary email address is not something operated by Money Button. It's just Gmail or whatever is your primary email address. So you can recover your account by proving ownership of that email address. Okay. Um, so what this means is we regularly have users that lose their wallet, which means the identity public key, which is the slash zero path of the first address. It's a long story, but the point is it's a deterministic public key from the wallet. The user can no longer access the private key corresponding to that public key. So they can't use it anymore. So what happens is basically when you reset your, uh, your wallet and money button, you generate a new wallet. You can always recover the old wallet at any future time if you ever remember your password or your mnemonic. But for some people, they never remember that. So they get a permanently new public identity key for the wallet. So not only do they lose their money, but the, the key that they were using for their identity uh, also changes. So there's this concept that users and keys are not the same. And we see this very clearly when users lose access to their keys, but retain access to their account. The user and the key are two different things. Um, and you can easily distinguish them. Just, just consider the, the concept of a car key. Um, if you give your car keys to someone, they don't become you just because they have your car keys. You could have loaned them your keys. You could have given them your keys. Uh, they could have stolen your keys. You could have lost them and they could have found them. There are countless ways in which some other person may become in, in possession of your keys, but that doesn't mean that they have your identity. Your identity and your keys are two different things. Keys are about control. 
not ownership. So keys are about access. Uh, you can sign something if you have a key. You can encrypt something. You can decrypt something. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, that you are equivalent to your key. Um, and I, I do think that things like house keys and car keys are, are really quite analogous in this respect that no one confuses your car keys for the person that owns the keys. Um, those are two different things. Uh, you can lose your car keys, have them stolen, and so on. It's, it's really quite similar, with the only difference being that it's a lot harder to replicate the car keys, uh, and it's quite easy to replicate a private key, um, but it's the same concept. Um, so anyway, uh, we have a semi-stable public key. And so what this means is when we do signatures like, and I'll, I'll link to the, uh, the sort of uh, the PayMail signature stuff that we did, when you create a signature, it's actually important that you provide the public key and the PayMail together. Because in order to validate a signature, what you really want to do is you want to validate the authenticity of the cryptography, that the public key corresponds to the signature, which corresponds to the data. Um, what that tells you is that only the possessor of the private key actually signed this message. But the thing is, that doesn't tell you who it is. So the missing piece here is, well, what is their name? Who is the person um, that, that actually did the signing? So with PayMail, what we're providing is one more thing. You should also attach the PayMail there. So that what you can verify is that, ah, okay, so I actually know who this person at this domain name.com is. That that's someone I have in my contact list or something like this. I know what that is and I can tell this by eye by just by looking at it. And so the user never has to see the public key or something like this. You're actually signing something with the PayMail and then you want to verify that with the PayMail. So you need one, you need to add in when you're like recording stuff like this on the blockchain or something like this or you're verifying it, one more thing. You verify not only does the public key match the signature match the data, but also does the, the PayMail match the public key. And because it's not a permanent public key, um, you, you really need to check things like, you know, uh, you know, like, does the PayMail currently provide access to this public key? Okay, so we have an API built in that basically allows you to query, uh, does this public key correspond to this PayMail? Okay, so you should have all four of those things together simultaneously. And, uh, you know, one other thing here, I mean, you know, there, there's this, this sort of like, you know, you can go back to the PGP days and, and, and people have this sort of, when you understand cryptography, it's very tempting to permanently allocate a key to someone. But I want to remind everyone, for all the reasons I was saying earlier, that simply does not work whatsoever. You cannot permanently allocate a key to a person. A key and a person are different. Uh, they don't map one to one. Uh, a key can be copied by many people. Um, there, it's not even constant in time. A person can lose access to keys. Keys can be transferred. There is not a one-to-one -one mapping between people and keys, nor is there a one-to-one -one mapping between names and keys either. Uh, but, but names are a, uh, you know, a, a more stable, let's say, uh, than, the, than the keys are. Um, so the idea of the names is that they should actually be pretty much permanent, um, unless it's something like, you know, uh, you know it's, it's sort of like, the, the way I see this working is something is similar to domain names, where basically, as soon as you have something real using it, it stays that way permanently, uh, or, for, or at least for the duration of the, the utility of whatever that name is. Um, so if it's a person, uh, basically the lifetime of the person plus something. If it's a company, it's the lifetime of the company and so on um, uh, for that name. Uh, but this is lasts longer than the, the keys do, which change more frequently. Um, okay, so I, I think that covers all of this. I mean, so the basic concepts here are users and keys are two different things. They simply do not ma map one to one don't equate a, a key to a user. Don't do this the PGP way. We're not doing things the PGP way. We're doing things a much better way, which is, well, well, the name is, is a much more realistic way to map something to someone that's much more stable than the keys. Uh, the keys are very deliberately only semi-stable and do change when certain things happen. They do change when you get hacked or you lose your keys or you transfer your keys or whatever the situation uh, may be. They don't map to an identity. Um, okay, so I, I think that's all I have to say for this video. So, so thank you for listening, and uh, you know we'll continue with these sort of uh, informational updates with respect to PayMail as I continue to learn uh, what it is that people do and don't understand about this stuff. All right, so thank you very much for listening.